This is a special edition of 17 News, a live debate between the candidates for the 32nd Assembly District between Rudy Salas and Todd Cotta, your moderators, Jim Scott and Eitan Wallace. And a good evening to you on this Thursday, and thanks for being with us tonight as we offer you a debate on the issues featuring the two candidates running for the 32nd Assembly District seat in our state legislature, Jim Scott, alongside Eitan Wallace. Here's a look at a map of the 32nd Assembly District. Assembly District 32 encompasses all of Kings County and in Kern County, the communities of Arvin, Delano, Lamont, McFarland, Shafter, Wasco, and parts of Bakersfield. So let's meet the candidates. Todd Cotta is the Republican challenger. He is 50 years old, married with two children. Born and raised in Hanford, he comes from a family with deep roots in agriculture. Mr. Cotta is a gun shop owner and firearms instructor. He served 20 years as a deputy sheriff in Monterey and Fresno counties and 12 years as a director on the Laguna Irrigation District in Kings and Fresno counties. Rudy Salas is a resident of Bakersfield and is running for his fifth consecutive term at uh, representing uh, the 32nd Assembly District. He's 43 years old and single. Mr. Salas holds two degrees from UCLA and served on the Bakersfield City Council for two years before running and winning his first term in the 32nd Assembly District. He is the Democrat. All right, and by virtue of a coin flip, Mr. Cotta will go first with opening statements this evening. Mr. Cotta, opening statement, one minute, please. Well, thank you for allowing me here tonight, and I'm so excited to be able to introduce myself to Bakersfield and the community down here. A lifelong resident of the valley, I love the Central Valley here and the Southern Valley. Experience means something. Experience as a small business owner, experience as in farming since I was a small child with my family. We farmed cotton, corn, walnuts, almonds, and peaches. We've done it all over the last 40 years. And I tell you, being a deputy sheriff for 21 years in California really opens your eyes to what happens in Sacramento and how that directly affects what we do on the ground here in law enforcement. At the end of the day, we need somebody in Sacramento who knows what it's like to be on the ground every day as a small business owner, every day on the ground as a cop. And that experience is sorely lacking and I need to get to Sacramento and I'm asking for your vote this next week. Thank you. All right, and Assemblymember Salas, opening statement, please, one minute, please. Yeah, thank you guys for having me and for hosting this debate. I think it's vitally important for uh, people to hear from the candidates directly. You know, look, I'm Assemblymember Rudy Salas. It's been a pleasure serving you over the last couple of terms. Uh, like a lot of you know, I was born and raised here in the Central Valley. Uh, like a lot of kids, you know, went to the local schools. Uh, in our summer and during the summer I went to go work out in the fields with my dad a uh, lot er, learned and earned some money the hard way know the value of hard work uh, and we've been able to deliver for the valley whether that's saving uh, Kern Medical uh, from going under whether that's uh, bringing 10 million dollars for Valley Fever uh, whether that's the nearly 14 million dollars we brought in for public safety uh, the two million dollars we got for Bakersfield College for career technical education you know at the end of the day it's about doing things for the Valley and doing things for our families right here in the Central Valley and I'm just appreciative of the fact that the voters continue to vote me in uh, so that I can fight on behalf of them and continue delivering for the Valley thank you Thank you, Assemblyman Salas. So let's open it up for some questions now. And we want to begin with COVID-19. Todd Cotta, I want to begin with you here. Let's start with your assessment of Governor Newsom's handling of the pandemic. One minute, please. Governor Newsom has been what I would consider one of the worst governors in the history of California. Not only has he had it handled the COVID-19 thing incorrectly, he has now kept pushing back the goalposts on COVID-19, keeping people unemployed, keeping people out of jobs. The, the, the economic destruction caused by him, even the World Health Organization has now said that lockdowns are a net negative for a society than a positive for all. When you take in the suicide rate, when you take in the psychological to toll on what's going on, this state should have been opened from the beginning. When you have a state of emergency, you must get out of it at the earliest possible moment. And we have never been with our resources, our law enforcement, and our medical industry taxed. This should have never happened. 
All right, Mr. Cotta, thank you. Assemblyman Salas, one minute, please. Thank you. I believe the governor could have been doing a better job with COVID. Uh, quite honestly, I know a lot of folks here locally were frustrated because they felt like the goalposts were continuing to move, trying to figure out what are the standards? How do we open up safely? And when they feel like those standards and those protocols keep changing, people get frustrated and understandably so. You know, that's why I've been continuing to fight and push the governor and the administration on these issues, uh, continuing to fight to make sure that we get resources here, we get PPE, personal protective equipment, making sure that we're continuing to deliver. I think that because we've been pushing so hard on the governor, that's why he formed the Central Valley Task Force to look at what's happening here in the Central Valley. And, you know, we're going to continue to keep pushing and we're going to keep continue to keep holding government accountable. All right, gentlemen, back in June, Governor Newsom ordered all Californians to wear face coverings while in public or in uh, high risk settings. Assemblymember Salas, do you support the governor's mask mandate? Look, I support the science, and science says when you wear a mask, you're safer. You're safer not only for yourself, but for the individuals that you're around. That's your neighbors, that's your, your family. You know, so when I go out in public, I'm wearing a mask. And so I agree with the governor uh, pushing that and moving that forward, but I believe we need to listen to the science and look at the science and what our health experts are telling us to do. Mr. Cotta, do you support the governor's mask mandate, sir? When you look at science, as my opponent here just said, Science is all over the mask problem on every level. Even the CDC at times had said masks are good, masks are bad. Even Dr. Fauci has said masks are good, masks are bad. And now just yesterday, the CDC released that the predominance of people who are catching COVID-19 usually wear masks. There is no scientific value to masks that have gaping holes in, that, that, that allow people to touch their face more often. Masks mandate is just another way for the government to tell us what to do and to get us under their thumb and make us line up like good little citizens. The government and the governor have no authority to tell us to wear masks. Um, Mr. Cotta, uh, Assemblymember Salas says he wears a mask when he's out in public. What about you, sir? I try and find businesses that don't have mask requirements. I myself at my own business do not have a mask requirement at my business. When I'm outside, that is the safest place. My folks are 80 and 77 years old and they do the same as me. They are not scared of this virus and they are not scared of what the media is feeding us when it comes to this virus. Okay, so thank you both of you for that. Now let's continue here with COVID-19, specifically Let's talk about the Latino population in this district and across the state. COVID-19 infection rates are disproportionately high within our Hispanic population. Mr. Salas, did the state underestimate the impact of COVID on our Latino communities and the thousands, perhaps tens of thousands of Hispanics who are working in essential jobs? Look, the government can always be doing more and the state capital should be doing more, especially when you look at the Hispanic population, but really uh, a lot of Californians. We're looking at Californians and we're trying to figure out how can we best protect people. And I think that's why you saw what, on the onset of this pandemic, you saw our office, you saw myself out there pushing for the resources, pushing for the personal protective equipment to get to our essential workers, to our frontline workers, uh, making sure that we were using the National Reserve to make sure that we had gloves and masks, not only for our nurses and doctors in the emergency rooms, but also for our farm workers and our essential workers that are making sure that the economy is still moving forward to make sure that we're still delivering. And so can more be done? Absolutely. But I am encouraged that because we've been pushing so hard that the governor's formed that task force to look at uh, COVID-19 specifically in the Central Valley. And I'm very encouraged by the Latino task force here in Kern County that's looking specifically at this population. You know, we're going to continue to keep doing what we're doing. I've been out delivering uh, personal protective equipment to farm workers. I've been out uh, on the front lines trying to hand out not only PPE, but even uh, food boxes for people that are having a hard time putting food on the table. Thank you, Assemblyman Salas. Mr. Cotta, I want to ask you the same question. Just to repeat, did the state underestimate the impact of COVID on our Latino communities and the thousands, perhaps tens of thousands of Hispanics who are working in essential jobs? One minute, please. Well, the state has failed the Hispanic community in many ways, including this. With the lockdowns we have right now, Hispanic-owned jobs are closing at a higher rate than other jobs, the small businesses, the small markets, and the restaurants. 
they have failed the Hispanics on many different levels. And education could have been better on Latino radio and, and, and in the workplace. But at the same time, we have to make sure that everybody is taken care of and everybody has the same opportunity to stay healthy and to be out there doing their jobs as essential workers because we all are essential workers in this state. I don't care if you work for a restaurant. I don't care if you're a cop. I don't care if you are a hairdresser. It is essential in this state because every job is essential. All right, gentlemen, with uh, the winter approaching, we are expecting a surge in COVID-19 infection rates. In Kern, if Kern and Kings counties are bumped back up into the purple tier, would you uh, support the shuttering of all these businesses again? Mr. Salas? Look, I think we need science to guide us and to make sure that we're making the right decisions. When you look at uh, the over 2,000 families that have already lost their lives here in the Central Valley because of COVID, I think you need to weigh that in. We need to make sure that we're balancing the needs of opening up with making sure people are safe, making sure our communities are safe. I think that's why you've seen us push so hard uh, for that personal protective equipment, making sure that we're doing everything that we can, whether it's social distancing or doing your part by wearing a mask out in public, is preventing the spread of COVID because that's going to help us not move into those more restrictive tiers. Just this last week, Kern County moved into a more positive direction because we've been taking these steps. Our businesses have been taking these steps. Community members have been doing what's right and taking these steps. And so I'm encouraged with what I see so far here in Kern County and, and what the residents in the Valley are doing. But at the same time, you, you got to be very mindful of those 2,000 lives that have already been lost here in the Valley as well. All right, Mr. Cotta, I think I know the answer to the question, but if we do experience a surge this winter in COVID-19 infection rates, do you support the shuttering of these businesses again? In Kings County about five months ago, well, three months ago now, they opened businesses for two weeks. So restaurants stocked up on food, stocked up in their bar. They got all their stuff ready to go, and then the governor turned around and shut it down again. Yes, every life lost is horrible. It's terrible. But we have other needs in society also, whether it's the mental health or the financial health of our people. These kids get in and out of school. We're going to open schools. We're going to close schools. This is not fair to those kids, especially the ones in the, in, the, in the minority neighborhoods, especially the ones that don't have the best opportunity for education. We must open this state, and unless our law enforcement, our medical and our, our, our government is taxed beyond belief that they can't handle the problem, no, this is not a state of emergency. And I want to stay with you, Mr. Cotta. We want to talk about jobs here. Obviously, a lot of people have lost their jobs, unfortunately, due to COVID-19. But uh, I want to also ask, how do we keep them in their homes, protected from evictions? And if the formula, if the solution involves money, where should that money come from, Mr. Cotta? One minute, please. Well, it's interesting that that question is a very good question. And this is how it, the government has locked us down, but yet they're taking no responsibility for the owners of these properties that have renters. And with all the rental rules coming around, it has been absolutely a disaster for these people that don't have a job now because his party shut this state down. Okay? We have to make sure that we get this state open as soon as possible so people can get back to work, so people can make their payments, and we can't encourage them to go on unemployment because right now, according to a statement in the Californian last week, there's fraud there and there's a backup in EDD of over a million people, but yet you should still go down and get on the government rolls. No, that doesn't work. Open this state, get jobs back open, let's get this economy booming again so they can make those payments. Thank you, Mr. Cotta. Assemblyman Salas, you were mentioned in that answer. I want to give you a rebuttal to that. But again, the question is, what should the state be doing to protect people who've lost their jobs from evictions? Look, we know people are suffering because of the pandemic. I mean, I hear it in my office uh, day in and day out, people that are calling asking for assistance because they're, they've lost hours at work or they lost their job completely. I think we need to go out. That's what the role of government is to do what we can to help 
our Californians, our individuals. And so I think that's why you saw earlier in the legislature at state capitol in a bipartisan fashion, Democrats and Republicans came together to actually pass legislation to help those people that were uh, in danger of actually being evicted. And I think that's why you saw that in a bipartisan fashion. You know, we need the federal government to step up. Congress needs to step up. They're either going to do a CARES package or they're not. But we need to know what we're doing, what we're dealing with. And uh, I'm waiting anxiously, like a lot of people here, uh, to see whether or not Congress is going to get its act together and actually help. All right, gentlemen, thank you very much. You're watching a live candidates debate here on TV 17. More questions for the candidates when we come back after the break. As a homeowner, it's easy to lose sleep in this economy. Prop 21 will make things even worse. 21 will reduce home values by up to 20% and eliminate legal rights of homeowners. 21 has no protections for seniors or veterans. And it even allows landlords to raise rents on the lowest income Californians by 15%. That's why homeowners and renters rejected this same bad idea two years ago. So for a better night's sleep, no on 21. In life, there's right and there's wrong. TJ Cox never learned the difference. It was wrong when his nonprofit had a million dollars go missing. It was wrong when time after time he failed to pay his taxes. It was wrong when TJ Cox defrauded investors and didn't pay workers. If you were guilty of this, you could be sent to jail. But TJ Cox thinks he should be sent back to Congress. NRCC is responsible for the content of this advertising. It's not personal, just a fact that Republican David Valadeo voted with Trump 99% of the time. Now your health care, that's personal. Valadeo voted with Trump to gut protections for patients with pre-existing conditions and create an age tax that would leave older Californians paying five times more than others for health coverage. It's why we voted David Valadeo out two years ago. Because David, what you've done is personal to us. House Majority Pack is responsible for the content of this advertising. It's Earner's 101st anniversary, and we're celebrating with huge savings at all C's Please locations. Like this cooling eye comfort mattress, now up to $1,000 off. Or beauty rest mattresses, now up to $800 off. Plus up to 60 months special financing and our 100 night sleep trial. And with our free in-home delivery, it's just too good to miss. So if a good night's sleep and saving money are important, then count on Earners Z's Please Sleep Center. Always trusted, always Bakersfield. And welcome back. Jim Scott alongside A. Tom Wallace here for our 32nd Assembly District Debate featuring the candidates for that very seat, incumbent Democrat Rudy Salas and Republican challenger Todd Cotta. All right, gentlemen, let's get back to the questions here. We want to transition here to climate change. A question here. Do you believe climate change is real? And second, do you support the science that links climate change to the burning of fossil fuels? Mr. Cotta, we want to begin with you. One minute, sir. I absolutely believe that we need to leave a world better for our children and grandchildren than we have today. And I believe that technology, as it gets better and better, is making our world cleaner and cleaner. There are lots of things we can do to make our planet cleaner, whether we can do it on a personal level or whether we can do it on a large-scale level, industrial level. But what I don't understand is how we cannot we can look in the past and see there's been ice ages as we've been we've seen there's been hot 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 spells in this country and how we even begin to understand that the earth is going to do what the earth is going to do and the sun is going to do what the sun is going to do regardless of how we do it down here so we can make some changes on this level and we do need to be as clean as possible but we cannot decimate society we cannot decimate industry we cannot decimate jobs in the name of 30 in 2035 having all electric cars that our grid cannot support. We have to make sure that we take care of business when it comes to keeping our world cleaner. And I want to ask you here a clarifying question, and I will give you 30 seconds to respond. To be clear, th the first part of that question was, do you believe climate change is real? I want to give you 30 seconds to respond to that question. I believe the earth gets hot, gets cold, it goes through cycles over millennia. So yes, we can contribute a little bit, but we are pretty bold to say that we are the cause of it when the earth is going to do what the earth is going to do regardless of what we do. 
Thank you so much, Mr. Cotta. And Assemblyman Salas, uh, again, the question, do you believe climate change is real and do you support the science that links uh, climate change to the burning of fossil fuels? One minute, please. Thank you. I believe climate change is real. When you look at all the scientists, uh, overwhelmingly they support uh, the science that says climate change is real. I think we need to continue to try to leave the world in a better place. I think that's why you've seen uh, myself join actually across the aisle uh, in pushing initiatives and legislation and things that will actually help our environment. So that whether that's, you know, when you look at our dairies here in the Central Valley, for instance, and pushing biodigesters, right, or you're looking at the solar projects that we've supported, or whether you're looking at even the tune-in, tune-up programs where we're getting old, dirty cars and dirty trucks off the roads and replacing them with cleaner burning vehicles, you know, that's the space you always see me operate in. We're, o we're out there rolling up our sleeves trying to get some real things done for individuals and really for the climate that's going to help clean up our year here in the Central Valley and really across the world. All right, gentlemen, uh, the governor has signed an executive order to ban the sale, as Mr. Cotta alluded to, uh, ban the sale of gas-powered cars in California by the year 2035. What do you, uh, do you support that, Assemblymember Salas? Thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, no, I believe the governor's uh, misguided in his approach uh, when he did that executive order. Uh, when you look at the impact that that's going to have just to Kern County and for our local economy and for our jobs here in the Central Valley, it's going to have a devastating impact. And that's why I've uh, actually called together a lot of the experts and the attorneys up in the Capitol to actually say, help me get the data so that we can find uh, exact all the impacts that are going to happen not only to the jobs but really to the economy for the state and really for folks here there's no real transition plan in the governor's executive order um, i've asked the administration for one i've asked the governor for one uh, we have yet to receive anything and that's why mm -hmm. i'm pushing and moving forward but i believe it's ill-advised all right mr cotter you already expressed your sentiments about this executive order but let me ask you this follow-up question do you think that executive order should be challenged through the initiative process sir the initiative process sometimes is taken to an extreme in this state and it needs to be challenged on the assembly level and on the, on, on the uh, Senate level in California. Mm -hmm. The production of lithium batteries on the planet is devastating. The things they call recycling or the things they call saving the earth like having windmills that you can't recycle the fans for, having a grid that needs to be 2,000 times as good as it is right now. We can't even have electric cars running in the state today because our grid just, to, just yesterday in Northern California had brownouts with the electricity. Hmm. We are in no position and the amount of, of environmental damage that's going to take to do his plan is more devastating than uh, and electric cars actually have the same 2002 print as cars do when you look at the manufacturing process through the life there is no benefit to it thank you so much to both of you all right let's move on here mr kata you are a gun store owner in kings county you know every night here on 17 news we uh, hear and report on a lot of gun violence mm -hmm. in this area so i want to ask you where do you stand on universal background checks for people who want to purchase firearms and ammunition? One minute, sir. The old phrase, guns kill people, no. People kill people, guns kill people. And we have 400 million guns in this country. Just like cars and drunk drivers kill people, irresponsible people with guns kill people. Universal background checks are something that are done nationwide every single day on every new gun transaction in America. I don't know where the argument is and I have no problem with background checks being done. I do have issues with the 10-day wait. I do have issues with the ammunition law. This gentleman here was endorsed by the NRA because he's the incumbent and he's voted negative twice on uh, bills for the NRA. So, but they still won. The bill still won. But he has never spoken out to bring our gun rights back, to get rid of our roster of guns, to, to vote and to get legislation up there to give us our ammunition back and our, and, and our sporting rifles back. So no, I'm here to fight for that thing. And yes, background checks should be done and are done across the nation. Thank you, Mr. Cotta. Assemblyman Salas, you were mentioned in that answer. Where do you stand on universal background checks? You know, we've been doing universal background checks in one form or another in the state of California for nearly 30 years. So I support universal uh, 
background checks. Uh, like my opponent said, you know, the, I have a really good record actually supporting the Second Amendment and people having their constitutional right to own arms and to bear arms. Uh, and I believe that's why I have a, a great rating with not only the NRA but also the CRPA. Uh, because I think, you know, the problem that we have to tackle is the people that illegally have guns and people that are actually doing bad things with those guns. And that's why you see me up in the state capitol pushing for programs that actually help law enforcement reduce the homicide rates. Uh, things like the Cal VIP program that coordinate resources between all of our law enforcement agencies so that they go, go out and tackle the underlying issues. And I think uh, when you look at what California has done, uh, just statistics alone show that California is actually 42nd in the country when it comes to uh, death by gun. All right, gentlemen, we have time for one more question. In light of social upheaval following a number of high-profile uh, deaths of black Americans due to excessive force or lethal force used by law enforcement, do you support the chorus of calls for police reforms in this country? And if so, where should we start? And what do you think the legislature's role should be in that? I, I gotta ask you for about a, a 30, 40 second answer. And I'll start with you, Mr. Cotta. As a 21 year deputy sheriff, I have seen it firsthand what we are trained to do and how we are trained to do it. California law enforcement officers, especially in Central California, have excellent training and are very, very, I would be surprised to see some of the atrocities like in Minnesota that happened with that neck and the guy. That was a terrible, terrible incident that should have never, never happened. But we have great cops in this state and they are very good and we must support them all day long, not try and put them in a box and tell them that they're all bad. Okay, 30 seconds for you, Assemblymember Salas. Uh, yes, no, I believe this is a real issue. We need to do uh, police reform, I think I, I showed and proved that earlier when I introduced Assembly Bill 1299. This was a, a measure that was actually embraced by, by everyone, by law enforcement and community groups that were asking for reform. Uh, we ended up getting Democrats and Republican senators and Assembly members on this. And this was a good common sense measure that said, look, uh, for cops that are trying to escape their background mm -hmm. or if there was an investigation on them because they either tampered with evidence or they had a sexual harassment as suit against them, that that investigation should continue all the way through. Because what was happening is those officers were being transferred or they were transferring themselves to other cities, thus bearing that city, um, you know, they were all negatively right. impacting the city that they went to, uh, whether that was either through lawsuits because of uh, uh, lawsuits because they were doing something bad. Okay. Thank you very much, Assembly Member Salas. All right, gentlemen, time for closing statements. Mr. Cotter, you're up first. 30 seconds, please. I love California. I love Kings and Kern County. I love farms. I love the uh, agriculture. I love cops, the cities, the mountains. We have the best of everything right here. I would like to request your vote for Todd Cotta this next week because this is where we need to save California and make it a better state than it is today. Right. It is not the state I grew up in, and we must get back to have a great California. Assembly Member Salas, 30 seconds closing statement, please. Uh, you know, first, let me just thank the voters and thank you guys for continuing to believe in me and for the support over the years. I think together, I always say we're Valley strong. And that's what I love about the Valley. I was born and raised here. My family still lives here. I wake up every single day asking myself, how can I make life a little bit better for the residents of the Central Valley? How can I make life better for my family members, my neighbors, and my community? Uh, and we've been able to prove and show that over the years, whether it was the $10 million we received for Valley Fever funding, the $2 million for career technical education, saving the Future Farmers of America program uh, for the entire state. This is what we do. This is why I get up in the morning and I'd be honored to have your vote come November 3rd. All right, gentlemen, that is all the time we have tonight uh, to our candidates, Assemblymember Rudy Salas and his Republican challenger, Todd Cotta. Gentlemen, thank you for your time and best of luck to both of you in your respective campaigns as we move forward. Indeed, and next Tuesday and Wednesday, this same time, 7 o'clock, we hope you can join us for the congressional debates, 21st and 23rd districts. For Jim Scott and everyone here at 17 News, I'm Aton Wallace. Good night, everybody. This has been a special edition of 17 News, your local election headquarters, a public service of KGET-TV.